Jumping in, we'll, we'll start. So welcome everyone to our event, Healthy Forests, Resilient Societies, Managing the Forest Water Nexus, which is a launch event for a new publication, A Guide to Forest Water Management. I am Elaine Springe, a forestry officer from FAO and a lead coordinating author of this publication. A uh, Guide to Forest Water Management, next slide please, Kara. Uh, a Guide to Forest Water Management is a joint publication of FAO, IUFRO, and the USDA Forest Service and made possible through funding and technical contributions from the European Commission. The publication provides guidance on how to manage, monitor, and evaluate forests for water-related ecosystem services, which are illustrated through some examples of key forest water ecosystems. I would like to thank our 41 authors representing 16 institutions, including Etifor, Enicol, and the Polytechnic University of Valencia. Without their contributions, this comprehensive guide would not have been possible. Our program for the session will include presentations from contributing authors, highlighting some of the key messages from the publication. The, this will be followed by a Q&A session. We welcome participants to type their questions into the chat throughout the event. Questions that remain unanswered may be addressed during the Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Mete Wilkie, the Forestry Division Director at FAO, to provide welcome remarks. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're dialing in from, and welcome to this session on Healthy Forest Resilient Societies. What you've heard so far from Elaine is that we want to talk about managing the forest water nexus. And this event is particularly to highlight and to launch a new publication on how to manage forest and water interlinkages. I'm very pleased to be here with you today to talk a little bit about that on behalf of the Food and Agriculture Organization, better known as FAO. Forest and trees and their interrelationship with water are vital for water security, for sustainable food systems, and for the resilience of both our communities and our landscapes. Most of our accessible fresh water comes from forested watersheds. Yet only 12% of our forests are actively managed with water as a primary objective. And if we don't manage our forests and trees in a sustainable manner, if we lose tree cover, if we degrade watersheds, we run the risks of soil erosion, forest fires, and downstream water stress. Climate change will only exacerbate these risks. This is why we need to manage our forest through a water lens to ensure that our forests and the ecosystem services they provide also contribute to food and water security, as well as to disaster risk reduction. Fortunately, managing forests to provide healthy water function does not need new management tools. Rather, it requires the application of existing tools through a lens that considers the multiple functionality of forested ecosystems, the location of those ecosystems in the landscapes, other management objectives, and scale. The Guide to Forest Water Management that we're launching here today is the first comprehensive global publication that covers the monitoring, the management, and the valuation of forest water interactions. It was prepared within and complements the information available in FAO's Global Forest Resources Assessment 2020. And as you've heard, it's a product collaboration of over 40 experts worldwide, supported by the European Commission, United States Forest Service, and the International Union of Forest Research Organization. As advocated in this guide, we need to halt the loss and degradation of our forests conserve and sustainably manage our natural resources and restore degraded ecosystems and their functions. The United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, which is co-led by FAO and United Nations Environment Program, provides a platform to work together to prevent further degradation of ecosystems and initiate their restoration in order to enhance people's livelihoods, 
counteract climate change and halt the loss of biodiversity. When it comes to forest and water, particular attention should be given to some specific forest types, mangroves, peatland forest, tropical montane cloud forest, and dryland forest. They are all vital to the provision of water-related services. And the Guide to Forest Water Ma Management tells us just how to do that. I hope you will enjoy the presentations during this event and that they and the guide itself will help stimulate discussions on how to further enhance forest management and governance for the provision of water for people and the planet. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Mate. Now I'd like to introduce Mr. Alexander Book, the Executive Director of IUFRO, to provide a welcome address as well. Thank you very much, Aline. <clears throat> Ms. Moderator, Meta, ladies and gentlemen, thank you also from my side for the invitation to provide this welcome address. I'm doing so also on behalf of EFRO Vice President, Professor Zhurong Liu, who is also the president of the Chinese Academy of Forestry, and as many of you will know, who is also a leading scientific expert on the topic of this session. Professor Liu would have very much liked uh, to join the session today, but I think we will all un understand that the time zone difference with China has rendered his participation practically impossible. As many of you will know, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations, in brief IUFRO, is a global network for science collaboration, uniting over 15,000 scientists in more than 600 member organizations in more than 125 countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will agree with me that forest and water are equally vital resources for life on the planet. Therefore, it is by no means coincidental that the United Nations established the 21st of March in every year as the International Day of Forests, and only one day later, namely 22nd March, was designated uh, as the World Water Day. As the topic of this session implies, the forest health and the resilience of societies at large depend on the way in which we manage the forest and water nexus. As has already been mentioned by Mette Wilke, forests and trees play an integral role in the supply of clean water for a range of uses. In fact, 75% of the world's accessible fresh water comes from forests. Importantly, forests also contribute to the resilience of water supply for humans in the face of climate change. Very appropriately and not surprisingly, forest and water interactions therefore also constitute a priority for the science collaboration in UFRO and the collaboration with our partners. Our efforts in this regard are threefold. First, UFRO seeks to connect forest and water researchers and research institutions worldwide and thereby further improve the scientific understanding of forest and water interactions. For this purpose, UFRO has established a task force comprising a large group of researchers from all around the world and from a broad range of scientific backgrounds. This task force examines the interactions and feedbacks between forests, climate and water at all spatial and temporal scales, taking into account issues such as climate variability and change, forest restoration, adaptive forest and water management, and so on. This UFO task force very actively also contributed to the preparation of the guide that we will launch today. Second, UFRO seeks to inform international policy processes, and in particular the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In May 2014, FAO, ICRAF, which is the World Agroforestry Center, and IUFRO jointly organized the workshop entitled Forest and Water from Research to Application in Kunming, China, which enriched the discussion on the future of international agreements on these issues. Shortly thereafter, in 2018, a global forest expert panel led by IUFRO delivered a comprehensive scientific assessment of the climate forest water people linkage. This global assessment report provided a comprehensive scientific summary of the vital role uh, of forests in achieving the sustainable development goals holistically. It was launched at the 2018 UN High Level political forum on sustainable development and supported the forum's deliberation. 
I'm glad that the above mentioned work, which we have done together, has now resulted in yet another milestone achievement, which is obviously the guide to forest and water management that is going to be launched today. The guide addresses the third major component of UFOS efforts, which is to provide effective guidance to practitioners on managing, monitoring and valuing forest and water relationships. I'm convinced that the guide is an important tool for practitioners to uphold and actively manage forests and forest landscapes for the provision of water services and also very important to engage local communities, stakeholders and investors into this commitment. I would like to acknowledge with thanks the important contributions by the UFO Task Force on Forest and Water Interactions to preparing the guide. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you will agree with me that international collaboration is truly essential for all these activities to have an impact. Therefore, UFO is delighted by the close collaboration with the FAO, the European Commission Joint Research Center and the United States Forest Service in preparing this guide. On behalf of IUFRO, I would like to express sincere thanks to all of them for the excellent collaboration. And I would also like to thank all the authors that were involved um, in, the, in the preparation of this guide. And I would like to articulate our commitment to the continued close collaboration in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, I now wish you and all of us an informative and enjoyable session and look forward to having the guide launched officially. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. So as mentioned, this guide provides information on how to manage, monitor, and evaluate forests for water-related ecosystem services. So now I would like to invite Steve McNulty from the U.S. Forest Service and a co-lead author to present on the importance of integrated forest water management. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you to the previous speakers for sharing that excellent insight regarding the, um, the development of this particular project. So the idea was that we would examine the importance of integrated forest water management. As we've just heard, that's a critical component of overall ecosystem sustainability and resiliency, in this case related to water. I'd like to thank my other co-authors on this presentation, as well as other authors not listed here. As was previously mentioned, there have been over 40 authors on the document that we'll be talking about today. And uh, I would it was a pleasure working with all of them. So as an introduction, we've heard that historically forests have had many uses. Timber, fuel, recreation, and food are a few of them. And that because these are major components of forests, we often manage specifically for these types of commodities. However, forests are also a very important source of clean, reliable water, but we seldom measure specifically for the water resource. Water is always a second thought. It's always something that we think, oh, well, we're getting timber, or we're getting food out of the forest. But water is something that we just assume is there and, and we really can't do that anymore for several reasons. We've talked about climate change and we've also talked about the increasing population of the world. These are both putting new and more complex demands on our forest resource. And in order to maintain the quality and quantity of water we have in the past, we need to specifically address management that will work with these uh, needed areas. So this brief presentation has a couple of objectives. One is to provide a, a brief overview of integrated water forest management, abbreviated as IFWM, also known as water-centered forest management. And this is discussed in the guide for forest water management, which we're presenting today. And the focus is on how ecosystem stress and adaptive management interactions can be either increase or decrease water resources. So in other words, there's always going to be natural uh, stress on the ecosystem, and then there's going to be human interaction with that stress. And depending on how we manage these systems, we can either increase or decrease how water resources are provided. And as previously mentioned, IUFRO is a major component of what this uh, document came to be. As, as was mentioned, here's an example on the right part of the screen of the forest water on a changing planet, a global assessment report released in 2018. 
And the idea was how we could optimize uh, forest management for a variety of goods and services. However, what this document did not do is specifically emphasize water as a resource. And so following the end of that document, we thought it would be a, a good idea then to go to the next area, which would be specific water management. And quoting from the document, the integration approach to forest and water management at the local, national, and transboundary scale is critical. So we can't only think about water at the, at the stand level or at the tree level. We have to think about that in an area that it scales from the very fine scale up to a much larger area if we're to manage our water most effectively. So there are certain compounding interactions associated with water management. One is that, as I mentioned, both forest water management and ecosystem stress interact. So if you have, for example, climate change flooding, that is a largely uncontrollable act, at least in the short, in the short scale. Um, but depending on what you do for forest management, as that flooding occurs, you can have more or less degradation of the water resource, sedimentation, erosion, those sorts of features. And we'll give an example of that in a minute. And also, the proper use of integrated forest management, both from anthropogenic climate change, for example, and natural forest disturbances can be minimized in regard to quality and quantity if we address both of these simultaneously. This graph is sort of the heart of what the chapter on forest management um, is talking about. On the left-hand side of the screen, we see changes in water outflow. On the right-hand vertical screen, we see changes in forest cover. And what we should derive from that is that the two are related. Generally, the more forest cover you have, the better the water quality you will have coming out of a forest. And then on the bottom part of the screen, on the um, x-axis, on the vertical, on the horizontal part, there's scale that goes from small to large. And as we think about integrated forest management, we need to think about water outflow from a quantity and quality. We also need to think about the changes in forest cover from no change to large changes. And we need to think about the scale under which we're doing forest management. So for example, on one end of the scale, in the lower right corner, we have large scale deforestation. So this is the denuding of forest area in a very large, large area. In the short term, you may have large flows of water coming out of these forests during rain events. However, the water quality from those areas is likely to be very low with a lot of sediment and soil erosion. Then when the rain event is over, the amount of water coming from these ecosystems may be much reduced. So you won't have a constant supply of it. In the upper right corner of this screen, you see the opposite, large-scale afforestation, the reforesting or foresting of areas. And this provides a much more steady um, supply of water over the entire year, and the quality is much better. Then as we look at the rest of this screen, it, it talks about selective logging, which is at a fine scale and may have no change, as well as a host of other types of activities that can occur on a landscape and will have varying levels of impact. The report goes into each one of these in much more detail. So let's take a look at an example of integrated forest management. And so the idea is, is that we need to protect water, not only in a small area, but in a larger area, and they need to integrate together. In this example, we'll talk about mountain logging. And in this uh, particular case study, because it's mountain logging, maybe it was done poorly, or even if it was done correctly, there's still going to be a certain amount of soil erosion and um, sediment that's generated from that because these areas have a steep slope and they're subject to a water loss that's very increasing. A lot of their or some of the water quality issues can be negated if downslope of where this logging occurred, we had forest wetland areas and we maintained these as a buffer for filtering the water uh, as it came in. Then as it entered these wetland forests, it would be clean, it would not be very clean, it would be dirty. As it left them, it would be much more clean. It would, uh, the sediment would filter out and have better water quality. However, we must also remember that there's social equity issues 
associated with this. And then we can't only worry about the mountain logging and what that impacts that would be, but what are the impacts of maintaining downslope uh, forest wetlands and what could negative impacts be to those individuals who live there? This is just a graphic that shows how scale works temporally, um, excuse me, spatially. Uh, this is for the United States. This is California, uh, highlighted in the number 18 there. And in management for California, they use the Sierra Nevada mountains and they rely on the water coming from there. And so it, if you look at this graph, you see that it scales from the very finest on the bottom, this 12 digit um, Hawk hydrologic unit code area, all the way up to much larger scales to scale 18, which is all of California. And management is occurring in each one of these watersheds. And together they interact to provide a, a large area of, of the US population with its water supply. And all of those need to work together in order to assure that that continues in the future. There's also the interaction of time and space. So large spatial impacts can, but do not all translate into long temporal impacts. For example, large scale deforestation can cause soil erosion and prevent forest regeneration for many years. It may take a long time for those trees to regenerate in those areas. And over that time, water quality issues will remain. However, even at the very finest scale, such as a single stream crossing, if the area is uh, degraded sufficiently, then that amount of sediment in the stream can exist for many, many years, decades, or even centuries to come. There are areas in the US that were degraded in the uh, 19, early 1900s that still exist, and the US Forest Service is still addressing those area, areas today. So the key messages from this presentation are that all forest stress and management start at the local scale, the stand scale, even if the impact is broad, basin or large scale. So we must always think about what we are doing at the very smallest level down to the tree. And remember that that has impacts uh, across much larger landscapes. And then adaptive management actions can also impact the quality and the quantity of water resources, depending on the forest resource objectives and that we can either have a positive or a negative impact on what those um, resources will, will be. And that the uh, amount of disturbance can also be reduced because of the type of management that we do. So there's natural disturbance, and then there's the impacts we have on them. Depending on how we handle this, those can either be exacerbated or minimized. And finally, it's very important to assess social equity at each scale if we're going to integrate integrative forest water management across um, very large scales. And we can't forget about those that uh, are actively involved at, at, the at the smaller scales so that it provides the types of resources we need for other populations. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Now, management decisions should be supported and informed by ongoing monitoring. So I would like to welcome Hugh Eva, a contributing author from the European Commission Joint Research Center, to provide a pre-recorded presentation on monitoring and reporting on the forest water nexus. Well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Hugh Eva, and I work for the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. I'm presenting a synthesis on the chapter on monitoring and reporting of the forest water nexus on behalf of my co-authors, Sara Casillas ramirez uh, Remy Denuncio, and Ellen Springer from FAO, and Director Ashutosh from the Forest Service of India. We'd also like to thank uh, Clara Yanuskova from the JRC, Steve McNulty and Dan Neary from USDA Forest Service, Eric Lindquist from FAO, and Professor Nicola Clerici from the University of Bogota for their contributions and comments on the chapter. Now, within the chapter, we review the global situation, how to measure forest water relationships, and moving forward, the different available methods, including remote sensing tools and field data to map forests. In this presentation, we tend to focus on the third component, 
but we do encourage you to review the full chapter in more details. And I think Elaine will put this in the chat. So where are we in terms of the current status of monitoring and reporting on the forest water nexus? We have to say that there's actually quite a lack of standardised methods for monitoring forests. Uh, this arises from a number of reasons, a lack of resources and capacities, regional biases, and other priorities for the forest monitoring, notably carbon and biodiversity. The World Resource Institute in their 2017 study estimated that in the late 1970s nearly 70% 70 of watersheds were covered by trees, but this declined to only 30% by the year 2000. But of course these data need to be updated and elaborated on. In terms of regional bias, over 400 scientific papers on monitoring and repairing forests with the mode sensing, only 14% occurred in the tropics the majority of these being affected in the Northern Hemisphere. An example of these studies is the European Union's Repairing Zones Initiative, covering 28 countries and using a full set of data on flooding, water flux, land cover and very high resolution data in a complex modelling approach. Now this of course is a data rich environment which is only available in certain areas. So what are the challenges? Well there really is a need for a definition of repairing forests at the global level but which can be linked to national definitions, such as the FAO have carried out with their Forest Resource Assessment Program. Can we develop a suitable classification scheme for repairing forests? And what are the parameters that we wish to extract? The scale, the minimum mapping unit, and the measures. Can we distinguish between natural and anthropogenic changes? We also know that different repairing forests present different challenges for monitoring. Let me give you an example of that. This is a tale of two forests. On the left, from the Democratic Repo Republic of Congo, there are reporting forests in the savannah ecosystem, which stand out clearly from the background. On the right, repairing forests, the brighter green areas, in the forest domain. Far more difficult to extract and to map. Of course, remote sensing is a powerful tool to remote uh, natural resources, such as forests, especially when they're situated remotely. Here we see an example of gold mining activities in the north of the Republic of Congo, some 1,000 kilometres from the capital Brazzaville, where the government gave out mining concessions several years ago. At first, we see the situation from Sentinel 2 imagery in 2016 before exploitation. The upland forests are in dark green and the riparian forests in brighter green. If we move forward to 2018, we can see where the watercourses and the forests have been removed leaving these blue and purple red traces down the rivers, these being water pools and bare soil where the exploitation has taken place. We can extract these areas and overlay them on the topographic maps. This gives government a support in monitoring the mining activity and ensuring that the concessions are working within the agreed area and respecting both forest and environmental regulations. This is the workflow. On the left, we see the input data, historical and recent satellite data. We extract a classification for stable forests in green, and forest change in red. These are then vectorized and overlaid on the topographic map. Now, in terms of tools available for remote sensing processing, we have desktop and also online desktop. This is the JRC impact tool and online tools the FAO CPAL tool, which gives you the processing for cloud-free mosaics, image segmentation, time series analysis, etc. Also, we have open source GIS available. There are also tools for product validation, such as Collect Earth Interface, and tools for supporting field measure, an example being Blue Targeting Tool. Now, more details of these can be seen in the text. In terms of the available data, of course, we have online satellite imagery for Sentinel and Landsat databases, and also very high resolution data for validation of products. These come from a range of centers, but of course, including the three meter planet data available through Norway's International Climate and Forest Initiative. We also have derived products such as digital elevation models and forest cover. We can use these in combination. Here we see the digital elevation model process to flow accumulation, stream order, then buffered, and then we overlay these on the forest map 
to give us a forest repairing forest product. So where are the gaps? Well, there are limitations of data and systems. Image resolution is not always adequate, and there's very few field level data available across the globe. Access to models and technology for handling such data are still lacking, and we have very few repairing network masks at the national level. We also notice that historical and present forest cover has limitations in dry forest areas in most of the products we see. GIS analysis needs to be improved, and we also need tailor-made interfaces to inspect, verify, and confirm changes. As we mentioned earlier, there's a regional bias, and there are very few studies, especially on Africa, uh, outside the Northern Hemisphere. So what are our key messages? Well, there are a lot of tools and methods out there, but they do need to be adapted specifically for the for forest water monitoring exercise. We also need to better parameterize what we require from a global product, and this has to be nested within the same parameters as the requirements and databases of national agencies. We know that the forest water monitoring requires mixed approaches that includes both remote sensing and field methodologies. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I apologize for not being with you, but my colleagues from FAO will be more than happy to reply to any of your questions. I therefore pass you back now to Elaine, our moderator. Thank you. And thanks to Hugh. So we've heard about why and how we should manage and monitor for the forest water nexus. Now we will hear from Etifor's Alessandro Leonardi about how to incentivize forest water management through valuing water services from forests. Hello everyone, I'm Alessandro Leonardi from Etifor. Uh, can you hear me? Great. So uh, I'm one of the co-authors of the chapter Valuing Water from Forests, uh, together with Mauro Masiero, Giulia Mato, Giacomo Laghetto, and Colm O'Driscoll, uh, so the team from Eddie for Valuing Nature. And given the limited time, uh, I'm going to uh, just to make curious uh, uh, all the, the participants uh, about the reading of this uh, chapter and the whole report. Uh, so regarding this chapter content, we started by providing a session on uh, estimating the value of forest uh, water ecosystem services. So providing all the background on the economic side. Then we move on into the policy and market-based instruments uh, that we have uh, at the moment to incentivize forest uh, um, water related services. Uh, then a subsession is also working on how to manage trade-off uh, between different uh, ecosystem services, dif different water uh, related ecosystem services, and also providing decision support systems uh, uh, for uh, the management of the trade-off. Finally, we want also to add some uh, uh, original content on how we can use marketing, communication, and branding in order to increase the the value uh, of uh, water-related uh, um, ecosystem services provided by forest. Um, so the valuation chapter start with a, a very impressive data. Uh, one of these are um, the global water services decrease by nearly US uh, the 10 trillion dollars between 1997 and 2011. So very impressive uh, loss of values. Uh, and uh, the valuation, why do we have to uh, provide the economic evaluation of water services? Because these, of course, bringing economics into forest management is one of the starting points for managing forests uh, uh, and all the benefits uh, they provide in a more efficient way. Um, within the chapter, we present uh, several evaluation methods, tools, and databases. Uh, usually, these concepts are quite uh, uh, complex, uh, very uh, scientific sometimes. Uh, so this chapter allows a policymaker and practitioner uh, to make this point clear, basically. Um, the second one uh, is more um, providing a set of tools. We start by saying that uh, there is a governance gap between the forest and water sector. In fact, these domains are usually managed by uh, different organizations and, and institutions. So we have many water-related actors, such as water utilities, hydropower plants, and so on, that are benefits from forest water services without valuing and paying for them. Uh, therefore, we present a set of uh, what we call payments for watershed services. 
which are promising mechanism for benefit sharing and cooperation among forests and water sectors and related stakeholders. Um, these schemes, uh, we, uh, we encompass a set of policy and market-based tools. So we, we adopt a very broad definition of these uh, tools. Out of nine types uh, of uh, payment for watershed service that we present specifically to the water sector, forest water sector, uh, the two most common schemes in the forest water domain are the water fees, usually uh, utility led, managed by water utilities, and multiple benefit partnership, usually uh, catchment or ba uh, river basin partnership uh, managed by a multiple um, partnership of stakeholders uh, with the common goal of uh, improving water and forest conservation in a basin. Um, just for the limitation of time, I'm going to present uh, just one of these two types uh, because the water fees uh, or utility led schemes uh, are usually most effective and most um, uh, and extended uh, uh, through regions and, uh, and countries. And in fact, they are based on the government's uh, regulation. Uh, we have governments from EU, Latin America, Asia, and South Africa that provide regulation and laws that uh, uh, are including in the drinking water sector or hydropower generation sector, water fees specifically driven to uh, incentivize and paying for uh, forest management activities directly linked with uh, the water uh, services. So we have an example, for example, but in, uh, in the repo, you will find uh, many of them. The Vietnam's Decree 99 contributed about 20% of the total forest sector investment in 2015. Um, and of course, you can check out the report for more case studies in relation to these uh, schemes. Legislation example, we have a set of uh, uh, legislation documents uh, and we summarize them in the report. And also very important is for policymaker, we have a step-by-step -step guide uh, to provide an advice to governments to set up these schemes uh, at country level. Um, finally, we want to conclude also with a chapter that is focusing on something, let's say, innovative uh, for this kind of project or schemes, uh, because we, uh, we conclude by saying that uh, we need to provide and use marketing, communication, and branding in order to increase the value of forests. We see that many times forests are not valued for the real uh, benefits that they provided to us. And we think, and usually in the economics, uh, it works like this, that the, the value of water from forests depend on people perception. So we need to, to increase people perception uh, because the value and therefore the price can be increased through appropriate marketing strategy to, incre to increase willingness to pay or to invest in people and their institution. Of course, our target are people, but also institutions that are driving investments, payments, and so on. The forest sector has generally failed uh, the basic rule of communication by focusing in uh, to, uh, within negative messages and so on. So we provide a set of tools within the report, uh, first by setting up a marketing strategy, so we tell the basic of this, how to set up a communication plan and also visual identity. These three are the main components of a, uh, of a great uh, marketing strategy. So marketing definition sometimes is, uh, is also making change happens. So please remember to use economics and marketing in order to increase the value of our forest. This is all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Alessandro. So with the general theory somewhat covered, and we invite you to look at the publication for more details, we now will have three lightning presentations on key forest water ecosystems, tropical cloud, montane forest, dryland forest, and mangroves. So I'll invite the first presentation uh, from Tyron Toledo from Inicol to present on cloud forests. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this chapter is focused in tropical montane cloud forests because they play a very important role in the regulation of the hydrological cycle in the watersheds. Oh, I cannot move the, sorry, the screen. I don't know why. There it is. 
And these forests are very heterogeneous communities in their composition and in the structure. In common, they have that the clouds or fog play a very um, important uh, role in their functioning. And therefore they have been defined as those forests that are frequently covered in cloud or mist. They characteristically host high levels of biodiversity of amphibians, insects, birds, plants with high levels of endemism. And their high water yield arises from their location in areas with high rainfall because they receive additional inputs of, of water from the clouds, which is uh, captured by the tree canopy, and because they present low evapotranspiration. Some recommendations to improve the provision of their uh, regulatory services are uh, the need to strengthen the conservation of remnant mature cloud forest fragments because we have lost more than 50% of their original cover worldwide. However, in the tropics, uh, new forests or secondary forests are dominating the landscapes and in this secondary forest, uh, the adequate um, logging method would be selective, uh, the polycyclic selective uh, system uh, that should conform with low impact logging guidelines. And due to the important loss and uh, degradation of these ecosystems, restoration is necessary. And uh, we recommend that mixtures of native tree species should be used preferably water use efficient species. And in this regard, we require research to identify a three species with high water use efficiency, as well as to assess the impacts of climate change on the hydrological function in these ecosystems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Taryn. So from high rainfall areas, we're gonna to go to low rainfall areas. And I invite Maria Gonzalez Sanchez from the Polytechnic University of Valencia to present on dry land forests. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, this chapter talks about dry land forests. So, first of all, what's a dry land? Dry land are biomes that are characterized by water scarcity, which means an aridity index below 0.65 which is the relationship, the ratio between precipitation and potential evapotranspiration. These biomes uh, cover around 41% of earth land surface. And within these biomes, dry land forests are mostly located in the semi-arid and dry subhumid zones. And they cover around 1 million hectares. They have developed functional, effective functional adaptations to cope with the combination of high temperatures and water scarcity. And of course, they support the livelihoods of millions of people globally. They are uh, widely represented all over the, the world. We have a uh, very good representation in its continents. So they are a very important uh, ecosystems. So what's the relationship between dryland forests and water? Water here is a very limiting factor. It affects the production, uh, not just the production of a particular ecosystem service, but also their, their long-term sustainability. There is a very fragile balance between water input and water consumption, which means that drylands are facing and will face a wide range of threats and challenge, which includes low productivity, water stress, climate variability, and of course, climate change, high risk of natural disasters and hazards, marginality, and remoteness, migration, and of course, population pressure. So they are quite uh, fragile ecosystems. So how can we manage this forest and how can we manage for water? As Steve has uh, pointed out, we have to focus on, on water also when we are doing forest management. In this case, it is, uh, it is quite easy because when you manage dryland forest, uh, you, you have to put the water at the core of, of the forest management because of this limiting factor. So you have to, to carry out an eco-hydrological management that will determine the trade-offs between water and vegetation because of, of this fragile equilibrium. So management strategies for dryland forests like canopy opening, pruning, uh, or species selection might help to combat local water scarcity 
because it will increase soil and groundwater research. Even though more, if more efforts here are needed to quantify and value the good and, and ecosystem services that these forests provide in order to enhance or to empower the, their management because they are already uh, forgotten ecosystems in terms of, of management as they are considered as low productive. And also here, the reuse of uh, treated wastewater for instance, for agriculture, can also, it's, it's a great help to maintain dryland ecosystem service in the face of water scarcity. And thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. And so we move from inland to the coast, and I invite Richard McKenzie from the US Forest Service to present on mangroves. Excellent, uh, hold a second. I thought, uh, I'm just assuming I'm sharing my presentation, sorry. Yes, please, Rich. Okay. Okay, uh, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, mangrove forests and uh, and their role in the water cycle and the chapter. Um, So I'd like to acknowledge Kenichi Shono, uh, my co-author uh, on this portion of the of the uh, the chapter. Uh, so mangrove forests uh, are forested ecosystems that are found along intertidal areas of coasts, uh, rivers, and estuaries in the tropics and the subtropics. And in 2020, their global extent was estimated to be approximately 14.8 million hectares. Uh, these uh, trees support. Uh, unique species of uh, are these forests support unique species of trees that are functionally adapted to survive being regularly flooded by salt water as well as living in waterlogged anoxic sediments. So they have got special processes that allow them to be uh, to grow where there's no oxygen, but they also have the ability to extract fresh water uh, from salt water, which I'll talk a little bit more here later. Uh, so mangrove forests are important uh, in that they support the livelihoods of millions of people around the world. They're an important source of food in that they provide uh, a wild source of uh, uh, fish, shrimp, and crabs that are used as food. They also provide uh, rot and insect resistant lumber that can be used for construction of boats or homes. And they're also an important source of firewood for cooking. Uh, the roots and the trunks of mangrove forests provide protection to coastal areas and save uh, human lives from storm damage. Uh, and we have a, a, a box in, in our chapter that breaks that down a little bit more in detail. And then lastly, we know that mangroves store more carbon per unit area than other, any other forested ecosystem, and therefore they play an important role in climate change mitigation. But what about water? Uh, there hasn't been a lot of research looking at water uh, and the role that mangroves play in, in, in uh, the global or the local hydrological cycle. Uh, but we do know from a few studies that have been conducted um, that uh, following the removal of about 10 hectares of mangroves, uh, there was a significant drop in the salinity in coastal waters, which suggested that mangroves were using fresh water flowing into the coastal waters and then returning it back to the atmosphere through, through evapotranspiration. Another study that was conducted in 2015 suggested that mangrove evapotranspiration could produce an amount of water equivalent to annual rainfall in certain years. So again, these trees are using fresh water flowing into the, into the ocean, as well as extracting fresh water uh, from salt water and returning it to the atmosphere. So what can we do in terms of managing mangrove forests for water? Well, there's a few uh, options that we've listed in, in the chapter. The first is to maintain wide mangrove belts uh, for several reasons. First, we know that uh, mangroves that are hundreds of meters uh, wide can significantly reduce wave height and protect coastal areas. Mangroves that are thousands of meters wide can actually reduce inland flooding. And both of these are important because it reduces the amount of salt water that makes it to inland areas where there are freshwater sources that are used for drinking and agriculture. So it minimizes saltwater intrusion uh, to those valuable freshwater resources. Uh, there's also evidence that healthy mangrove forests growing along the coast, again, through this evapotranspiration, can lower the water table and essentially remove it from saltwater intrusion. So several uh, mechanisms that mangroves are protecting coastal areas. Other uh, 
uh, strategies for managing mangrove forests obviously prevent mangrove uh, conversion to other land uses uh, or conserving healthy mangrove forests. Both of those are easier uh, because you can maintain the many ecosystem services that the mangroves are providing. Uh, and then lastly, uh, restore mangroves, uh, ideally where there once were mangroves, so reforestation, not afforestation. And many times, if we just assess the cause of degradation, we can restore mangroves without planting a single tree by simply restoring the hydrology or the elevation. Um, although planting can be used as a strategy, uh, it just requires some careful consideration to make sure that the restoration is successful. And lastly, all of these efforts, uh, again, uh, would result in the maintenance of an intact, healthy forest that we believe will uh, can contribute significantly to water in the atmosphere through high rates of evapotranspiration. And that water can then be utilized by upland forests and streams as well. Uh, though we need definitely need more research to look at that. Uh, so with that, uh, thanks for your time, and I will uh, take any questions. Thank you, Reed. Um, good morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, my name is Sara Casades, and I will be moderating today's Q&A session. Um, right now, we have about three minutes for questions. So I would like to ask the presenters um, Steve, Alessandro, Tyrin, Maria, and Rich, to in one sentence, so this is a challenge, to in one sentence, sentence give us a key message uh, that you have for the water community that could foster better collaboration, better intersectoral collaboration, actually. So what is the one message in one sentence? Um, Steve, I will go to you first. Thank you. Uh, I guess the one message is don't take the forest for granted when it comes to water resources. Uh, they seem like they're very resilient, but they're also very fragile. It doesn't take a lot. Oh, I'm past one sentence. Sorry. I'm rambling, but don't take the forest for granted. Manage them, manage them um, preactively. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I will now go to Alessandro. Yes, in one sentence, I can say don't take stakeholders, so forest and water stakeholders for granted uh, and make them uh, involved in the management and in the governance. And that will lead to a more efficient organization and investment uh, in this sector. Thank you. Uh, I will now move to Taryn, please. That was a surprise. And the first thing that comes to mind to me is to, to go to the forest, visit them and encourage people to go and see them because I think that we care for the things that we know and, and, and that will be what I will advise. <laughs> Thank you, Taryn. Uh, Maria, I will move now to you. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, in one sentence, I will say that dry land forests matter, and for that, we should quantify, accurately quantify the goods and services uh, that come out of, of, of this forest and the, for, and the forest management. Thank you, Maria. And Rich, uh, now back to you. One, one sentence, I guess, would be uh, conserve or restore forests for improved water quality and quantity, period. Very succinct. Thank you very much. Um, and I think this leaves us now with the closing of our session. So I will give the floor back to Elaine. Elaine, please go ahead. Well, I think there is another a minute or two if there are any questions. Um, and we do. We got one from, from Kevin Webb who asks, would you agree that people need to be better educated as to the benefits to the water quality of healthy forests? Uh, which of the panelists would like to take on that question? I see a few head nods. I think it's really interesting. I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Um, I think it's really interesting. One of the old um, adages that I heard the first time I went to China is that from forest water will come. So we've understand understood at least that at some level the, this relationship between clean water and, and forestry for millennia. Um, but sometimes I think we take that relationship for granted. 
And we need to, especially under climate change and other stressors associated with forests, we need to re-examine the fragility of forests and their ability to provide these resources. Um, not, and it's not without uh, limits. There are, there are limits to what the forest can provide and how much abuse it can take before it can no longer function properly. So yeah, education on, on what the forest can provide and how to manage them is more important now than ever. If, it can, if I can also add, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, in my work, we, we work with water utilities uh, and usually policymakers are uh, very scared about uh, putting some uh, like one euro, one dollar for the management of a forest from where they derive the water, the drinking water. Uh, but usually people don't care. They, they like the idea of uh, paying $1 more to invest on uh, better forest management. Uh, so I think we should also educate how a policymaker, because usually they think that we, I mean, the, the population is not willing to, but uh, actually we are, we are ready for. And if I may add, I think it's important that we don't go into oversimplistic messages. The forest water relationship is complex. It's contextual, it's not always positive, it's not always negative. Um, we need to make informed decisions based on realities, which does mean uh, monitoring, conducting research and better understanding what these relationships are. So we're not jumping into false assumptions. I think the forest sector tends to promote forest water relationships as something generally positive. The water community tends to see this as something sometimes generally negative. We need to work together to to figure out what what is actually happening and how we can adapt our management to ensure that these services are being delivered. Um, so on that note, we actually uh, we've only got a few minutes left. I don't see any other questions there. I uh, to close, I would like to say thank you again to all the presenters and contributing authors. Thank you to all of the participants for joining us for the launch of a guide to forest water management. Uh, Chiara has shared the link in the chat. Forest and water interactions are complex and contextual, as I, as I mentioned, which means that we have to use a variety of tools, many of which are highlighted today and can be found in the guide. Uh, we acknowledge that there are still many gaps and answers needed to effectively manage forests for water services, and that more discussions and, and opportunities like these, especially between the forest and water sectors, are needed. However, we hope that this event and the publication has raised some important considerations for integrated forest water management, including monitoring and valuation, and that uh, the dialogue can continue. We see this really just as the start of a conversation um, and that this needs to continue in the future. So please check out uh, our publication online. We also invite you to find out more about uh, FAO's work on forests and water on our website, uh, which I also hope will be added to the chat. Uh, so please do send any further questions you may have to our forest and water program. So thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of World Water Week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Take care, everybody.